Greetings, and welcome back, gentles and ladies, men, to another rip-snorting episode of Remake or Rebreak. I'm Exa Paradigm Gamer, and last time we met, we did an eight-part, or rather a collection of eight mini-reviews on the first eight classic Mega Man games in preparation for today's episode, which continues the mediocre marathon, where we're looking at remakes that are decisively not so great. More remes and rebreaks, if possible. And the subject of today's video is Mega Man and Base on the Super Nintendo and Game Boy Advance. Now, this game was originally only released in Japan on the Super Famicom, and wasn't released internationally until 2002 with the Game Boy Advance re-release. Now, this version is widely considered inferior to the original, and the original is not highly regarded to begin with. So, I think it'll make an interesting episode both in terms of the game itself and how the two versions stack up against each other. So, without further ado... EXO Paradigm Gamer, you ruined my future! Papa J Mac from THE Jay's Reviews YouTube channel, what are you doing here? You know damn well what I'm doing here, in a convoluted, shoehorned in plot that even TGX laughed at, you came back from the future to crash my quest for booty review and steal my subscribers. Links in the card in the description. Give me all your ad revenue. Wait, 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 hold on. If it was future me who came back in time to ruin your review, then doesn't that mean I haven't done it yet? Well... I guess. So what's your problem? Go pick up your complaint with future me instead. Not good enough. For this dishonor upon my name, you owe me recompense. Oh, all right, all right. If it'll get you off my back. I am doing a review of Mega Man and Base right now, and I suppose there's room for one more. Hmm, it's a start. After all, maybe this will feed all the hungry Mega Man fans clamoring for Mega Man Zero reviews after the world-renowned, all-inclusive Mega Man X retrospective. Links in the card description. But I better get a good deal out of it. Mega Man and Base was originally released in the Super Famicom in 1998, the year after Mega Man 8 released for the PlayStation and the Saturn. Apparently older hardware tends to have a much longer shelf life in Japan, and the developers felt that a lot of people had missed out on Mega Man 8 due to not owning a PlayStation, and decided to throw those people a bone with Rockman and Forte on the Super Famicom. Instead of downgrading Mega Man 8, they decided to remix the existing assets and make a whole new game out of it. The Super Famicom version was never released outside of Japan, and it wasn't until the game was re-released in the Game Boy Advance in 2002 that North America Americans and Europeans finally got their hands on an official, localized version of the game. The game has since developed a reputation for being one of the hardest and also one of the worst installments in the classic Mega Man franchise, seeing as the GBA version was the only one that got an official release in the West. That's the version most people have played, and those who have played the Super Famicom original largely consider that the superior version for reasons we'll cover in this video. I first played Mega Man and Base in the year 2015. In my X1 review, I had said that this was the year I got into the Mega Man franchise, and the GBA version was released that year on the eShop as a part of Mega Man. I played it as Mega Man, but I didn't get very far since I was too busy defending X3 on the forums. At Too Many Games 2015, I picked up a copy of X3 on Genesis, which I paid $70 for, and upon looking up footage, I destroyed the cart and gave Moses the remains. I'd also picked up a reproduction card of Mega Man at base on the Super Nintendo, and after giving the game a second chance, I realized just how much I enjoyed it. As for me, I didn't first play Mega Man at base until this past April, when I finally received this fan-translated reproduction cart in the mail. By the way, I would advise against buying your reproduction carts from GameReproductions.com. I imagine it's not easy to run a side business making reproduction carts, and having done similar customer service work myself, I have an inkling of what it's like to be on the other side. However, everything about my transaction with the site just left a bad taste in my mouth. The site owners failed to keep record of my payment and didn't bother to tell me, which delayed my order by months. Their customer service is spotty, unresponsive, and unhelpful, and the cart labels look abysmal. I spent 10 extra dollars to get real stickers, but that doesn't really matter much when the actual art is lazy and terrible. To give credit where it's due, when my carts did finally show up many months 
months later than they were supposed to, they did work just fine in both my Super Nintendo models, but it really wasn't worth all the money and time I spent trying to get these things delivered. You're much better off just buying your reproduction carts at local retro game stores and stomaching the inflated price. Anyways, going into my first playthrough, I was gearing myself for the controller breaking frustration people often recount in online reviews. While I did experience some mild frustration here and there, I found the game to be far more reasonable than people had led me to believe. After finishing a second playthrough as base, I knew I had to review the game on Remake or Rebreak to see how the GBA re-release differed from the original and to offer a critical defense of the game itself. As always, Remake or Rebreak is a review segment where I, and in this case a special guest, revisit the classics of the past to see whether they hold up today, with a special emphasis on whether and how well subsequent significant re-releases recreate and improve upon the original experience. Ultimately, the goal is to clarify options for experiencing classic games and come to some sort of recommendation. The transition from Super Famicom to GBA involves both a significant hardware shift as well as significant software differences, which to me is enough to warrant an episode of this segment. Additionally, because we never got an official release of this game in the West, that makes it all the more important to know the differences and what we may have missed out on. Without further ado, this is Mega Man and Base Remake or Rebreak. We begin, as always, with the story, or what little there is. Every game in the series besides Mega Man 1 and 3 has had a detailed intro cinematic that delivers important exposition and sets up the story to contextualize the gameplay. Sure, Mega Man 8's anime cutscenes may have some of the worst voice acting you'll ever hear, no! but they get the job done. Mega Man and Base, meanwhile, does not have an opening cinematic. Looks like we're gonna have to find the story in the manual, which reads like it was translated by a five-year-old. Seriously, for the early 2000s, this is some shockingly awful localization. They couldn't even be bothered to substitute the Japanese character names for the North American ones, and oh, what the hell, they spelled the villain's name wrong. Dr. Willy's only supposed to have one L, not E. Supposedly following the events of Mega Man 8, a power a powerful new robot named King has appeared and has taken over Wily's new fortress. With an army of robots at his command, King threatens to take over the world. Now kicked out of his own base, series antagonist Dr. Albert Wily orders his greatest creation, Base, from Mega Man 7 and 8 to take out King and recover his lab, while Dr. Light sends out Mega Man to stop King and bring peace to the world once again. It's not very clear if Mega Man and Base are working together, but given the role of Proto Man, I think it's safe to say that these two stories cannot take place at the same time. When come to think of it, Mega Man 9 references Mega Man's ending from this game, so maybe that was the and one. But in my X5 review, I highlighted the fact that the game shows events from both X's and Zero's playthrough from X4, so whatever. Either way, the two characters never interact in the game, which is kind of disappointing given their ongoing rivalry. Ultimately, this story is kind of lacking. Mega Man 7 increased the importance of story in the franchise, with more in-game cutscenes and a more detailed opening and ending. Mega Man 8 follows on this trend, despite its subpar localization holding it back from maintaining the same quality standard. With Mega Man and base, it feels like they wanted to maintain this focus on story from the previous two games, but the lack of an opening cutscene alone, compounded by the poorly translated manual, means that a lot of important background information is kind of up in the air. The exposition Jay just gave us is just our best guess as to what's going on. Beyond that, however, there's a twist later on regarding King, and if you've ever played a classic or X game before, you can probably guess what it is. The difference here is that it feels particularly contrived, especially in Base's scenario, and it's pretty obvious that the developers started from the concept of Mega Man and Base having to defeat a common enemy and wrote the story backwards with little regard to making the end twist add up on Base's side of the story. I will say that there is one pretty great scene between Base and Proto Man and Mega Man's ending pays off on King's arc, but that's not enough for me to call this a good story. At the end of the day, it gets the job done, but it feels half-baked. The presentation, however, is a step in the right direction compared to Mega Man 8. There's no terribly translated and acted English voice acting in this game, or overly compressed FMVs for that matter. <laughs> Although, the official translation in the GBA re-release is still pretty bad. I mean, it's serviceable enough, the sentences are easier to understand than anything in Mega Man X6, which came out the year before, and I guess it's an improvement over Mega Man 8 on the whole. Still, this game came out in 2002, and the fact that Capcom's localizers never seem to get any better after so many classic and X-series games is just kind of baffling. Character motivations seem improperly spelled out, especially for base, their spelling or grammatical errors, and it just overall reads like a kindergartner wrote it. Honestly, the fan translation patch by Aeon Genesis 
Genesis for the Super Nintendo version is so much better than the official one that it's not even funny. This is the translation that Jay and I have on our reproduction cards. Character motivations are made much clearer, especially with Bass and Dr. Wily and how they relate to King. All the dialogue is perfectly understandable, but has kind of a Ted Woolsey Final Fantasy charm to it, and there isn't a single spelling or grammatical error to be seen. I don't really know which translation is more accurate to the original Japanese script or if certain plot elements felt contrived to begin with, but the Aeon Genesis script reads better and comes off as the more cohesive script on the whole. While the story and presentation leave something to be desired, the visuals fortunately don't. Just a heads up, all the footage you're seeing was recorded from my RGB modded SNES 101 and upscaled using the XRGB Mini Framemeister. The Game Boy Advance version was recorded using an authentic cart and my DS capture card. The 8-bit style may be classic and all, but Mega Man 8 gave us a welcome revision to the classic series art direction, completely redesigning the characters to give them more of a standard anime look while maintaining the overall design of the characters. The new art direction just works for the lighter tone of the classic series while not taking it to its logical extreme like Mega Man powered up's chibi characters. Seeing as Mega Man and Base came out a year after Mega Man 8, it carries over the same art style and visual design. In fact, a lot of the sprite work and background set pieces are directly recycled from Mega Man 8. I do find that the colors aren't quite as bright or saturated as Mega Man 8, likely owing to the SNES's lesser color capabilities. On the whole though, this is one of the best looking games in the series, right up there with Mega Man 8 for sure. I dare say it's the best looking Mega Man game on the system, beating out the SNES X games and the cartoonier Mega Man 7. The character sprites have a surprising amount of detail, and while the animations don't have quite as many frames as Mega Man 8, the player characters still move very smoothly. The environments now have a 2.5D look to them, which makes them pop a lot more than the flat 2D ones from the previous games. While the concepts for the Robot Masters aren't the most original in the world, hell, Astro Man and Tengu Man are literally reused from Mega Man 8, the actual character designs are really well done, and it makes me wish we got more games in this art style as opposed to going back to 8-bit for Mega Man 9 and 10 for nostalgia's sake. Thank goodness the now upcoming Mega Man 11 seems to be moving on from all that, giving us an art style that looks like Mega Man 8 in 2.5D. Of course, I would have had to add this in if EXO had just gotten the thing out beforehand, but that's neither here nor there. As for the graphics in the GBA re-release, it's pretty much unchanged compared to the original. From the sprites to the environments, everything looks just as great here as it does in the SNES. In fact, the smaller screen size actually makes it look a little better in some ways. The original game used a lot of dithering, which as I always say is a way for systems to only taking color. about four minutes total. It feels like it goes on longer than EXO's technical breakdowns on resolutions and dithering. Well, you get the point. The way that the game is colored and shaded combined with the intended display technology produces a visually appealing result, and playing the remake on a tiny handheld screen produces a similar effect. While the pixel perfect look still looks great for this game either way, I do think that the visuals benefit from the original display. Otherwise, the visuals are pretty much the same, though I can definitely tell a difference in the GBA's colors. Moving out of the soundtrack, it defied all my expectations and ended up being one of my absolute favorites in the entire classic series. I'd say it tops Mega Man 7 both in terms of the samples and the quality of the compositions. I love pretty much every piece in the OST, from Cold Man to Tengu Man, to the Robot Museum, to the fantastic boss theme, to the incredible King's Fortress, with my absolute favorite being the theme from Pirate Man Stage. It's just an excellent, memorable OST from start to finish. I'd have to agree with Jay almost word for word, but I'll go a step further in calling Mega Man and Bass my top favorite classic Mega Man soundtrack. This is, in my opinion, the most consistent, best composed, and most memorable soundtrack the series has seen yet. My top track would have to be Magic Man, which is also my absolute favorite Robot Master theme to date. True to its name, it really is magical. Let's have a listen to a few tracks, why not?
Despite what you might expect, given the differences between the SNES and GBA sound hardware, as well as memory limitations, the sound design is surprisingly intact. Mega Man and Bass reused a lot of sound effects from Mega Man 7, along with a few new ones, and they sounded great there and sound pretty much the same here. The only difference is the Thunderbolt sounds, which sound lower quality compared to before. The music, on the other hand, is a bit different. Being the GBA apologist that I am, I can't bring myself to hate this OST, and given the standards of the system, I think it could have ended up a lot worse. While better than Mega Man Zero 4, compared to the first three Zero games which came out around the same time, it clearly could have turned out a lot better. I guess the main criticism we have is that some of the samples sound high quality while others sound like standard 8-bit channels, and the two just clash. If you've ever heard the OSTs for Sonic Advance 1, 2, and Battle, it's kind of like that. There are a few sections of certain pieces that I prefer from the GBA, like the last bit in Magic Man's theme, or the save screen music, but overall I think the originals got the better sound for sure. Not bad for GBA music, but it's not as good as it could have been like I said already. So now let's move on to the gameplay. After beating the typical intro stage, we're taken to the Robot Master stage select screen. One of the basic Mega Man gameplay elements is the ability to pick one of eight stages at a time in any order you want. A consistent problem running through a lot of these games is that there's usually only one really good order to play the stages, seeing as some stages will be harder than others, with bosses being more beatable with the default weapon than others. This is a running theme in my Mega Man X reviews, that they always had bosses that were unbeatable without their weaknesses like Spark Mandrel or Toxic Seahorse. Unless you want to look it up online, there's going to be a lot of trial and error in finding out what the best weakness order is, which defeats the purpose of having eight stages selectable from the start. On that note, one of the great innovations of Mega Man 7 and 8 was the introduction of a two-tiered Robot Master system where they started you off with four Robot Masters with generally the same difficulty, then giving access to four more stages with the difficulty ramped up in comparison to the first four. Almost every Robot Master in these games, with the exception of Slash Man and Astro Man, were perfectly beatable with the default weapon, which resulted in an unprecedented level of open-ended progression while also offering a more comprehensible difficulty curve. Mega Man Base seems to follow on this trend with a new system where you start with three Robot Masters, those being Cold Man, Astro Man, and Ground Man, all those being beatable as first picks, though Cold Man is clearly the easiest of the bunch. Beating these will unlock more stages along a grid, which is actually a pretty great system. As always, there's a preferred weakness order that makes the game more comfortable, especially seeing as helpful items unlock in the shop as you clear stages, but there's still more true freedom of choice in this game than there were in a lot of the classics and X games. Also, the grid system will ensure that two of the tougher bosses, Burner Man and Dynamo Man, are impossible to fight without their weaknesses. Magic Man unfortunately isn't, but we'll dive deeper into that when we talk about the bosses themselves. So obviously, one of the main gimmicks with Mega Man and base right off the bat is that you're given the choice of playing as either of the title characters, each with unique abilities. Mega Man is pretty much the same he's been since Mega Man 4. He can slide to dodge attacks and squeeze into small spaces, and charge his buster for more powerful attacks. Base, meanwhile, plays like a combination of Zero and Axel from the later X games. His base buster sports automatic fire, and he can aim his arm cannon in eight directions. In terms of platforming, he's rocking a Mega Man X-inspired dash and a double jump. Obviously, because of how differently the characters control, the two campaigns offer very different experiences, not unlike Mega Man X4's X and Zero campaigns. We'll get into more of the differences between the two characters as the review goes along, but right off the bat, we want to address some common wisdoms about this game. Most people will tell you to pick base, because the game was supposedly designed around him. The same people will also tell you that Mega Man's moveset is so woefully unfitting for the game's level design as to make the game super frustrating and unfair, if not nearly unplayable. Not surprisingly, these sentiments are often repeated word for word in online reviews. Now, opinions are subjective by nature, and you're almost certainly entitled to yours, but I think Jay and I are in total agreement when we say that we have no idea what game these people have been playing. Most likely, they're referring to the GBA re-release, which would certainly make a lot more sense, and I don't mean to suggest that there isn't a kernel of truth underlying these complaints, but to suggest that Mega Man is a broken character that doesn't work for this game and that it's built for base and nobody else would be to completely ignore or exaggerate how the game is actually designed. There are actually a lot of benefits to playing as Mega Man, and no small amount of disadvantages to playing as base. Is Mega Man's campaign harder than base's? Yes, but it's not that cut and dry, because there are pros and cons to playing as both characters. To explain why requires more elaboration on the game as a whole. 
I think the first thing worth discussing is the stage design. Unlike the contemporary PlayStation Mega Man side scrollers, the stages in Mega Man and Base don't have permanent checkpoints. So getting a game over does mean redoing the stage from the beginning, but thankfully the stage length in this game is pretty reasonable and not kept at a Mega Man 8 length. I think most people could pull through these stages in five to six minutes, though obviously this will somewhat vary from stage to stage, it depends on whether or not you're dying frequently. Even then, checkpoints are still more frequent in Mega Man and Base than they were in the first seven games. On that note, one convenience added in the GBA version is that a now saving text box will come up to let you know that you got a checkpoint. In terms of how these stages are actually built, the level design is actually pretty airtight in my opinion. It's a nice improvement over a lot of Mega Man 8's level design, where if you weren't playing the gimmick sections, most of these stages were just straight lines with enemies on them and some fairly easy platforming. Of course, Mega Man and Bases stages do take inspiration from their Mega Man 8 analogs. Magic Man, for example, carries over the trains and skull platforms from Clown Man stage. A lot of the enemies are also ripped straight out of Mega Man 8 as well. Well, that's not to say there aren't plenty of new ideas to enjoy here. A lot of the Mega Man 8 enemies have entirely different behaviors or are now placed in different contexts that make them more interesting to fight. While the mini bosses are also completely new, and Astro Man and Tengu Man stages now sport fresh set pieces and ideas and are altogether more straightforward and enjoyable to play than their Mega Man 8 equivalents. For the most part, I legitimately enjoy almost every stage in this game, with the exception of a few annoying moments we'll cover sooner or later. Hell, even the intro stage is probably one of the best in the entire franchise. Usually these are just straight shots to the end of the boss fight, and the point was usually just to set up the plot. The Robot Museum in Mega Man and Base, by contrast, is actually a level and a pretty fun one at that. It's also a great organic tutorial that rivals even the Robot Factory from Mega Man X2, featuring platforming and combat set pieces that teach you the pros and cons of both characters through gameplay. And the strong design of the intro stage extends to almost every other level in the game. Every stage has a healthy dose of both platforming and combat, as well as the occasional mini-boss or puzzle elements to shake things up. Mega Man in base is never sticking to one thing for too long, but at the same time, none of its ideas ever stray so far from the core Mega Man gameplay as to come off as forced like the gimmick sections from Mega Man 8 and Mega Man X8. The game is also great for the most part about giving you all the information you need to clear a given stage just by looking at it. And because of that, virtually every set piece in this game is perfectly playable for both characters. Now, to get back to the character differences for just a moment, people often complain that these stages were designed around base's moveset first and foremost seeing as he can dash and double jump, and can even string the two together. I think it would be hard to argue that Base doesn't have an easier time with platforming in this game as a result. In fact, there are a lot of sections he can outright skip with some relatively simple maneuvers, and his double jump is great for recovering from knockback against enemies. Clearly, Base's biggest advantage is in the platforming, and I think most people would agree. It's worth mentioning that in the GBA version, Base slacks a dash button since there weren't enough face buttons in the GBA, and the shoulder buttons were taken by the weapon switching. Despite that, though, I don't understand why there couldn't have been some kind of control configuration. You have to double tap the D-pad to get base to dash, which is kind of annoying seeing as the Mega Man Zero game is assigned this command to the L button, which is really comfortable. But oh wait, there I go again, spoiling those reviews that everyone's waiting for. Now, given how much people complain about Mega Man's limited platforming abilities in this game compared to base, I came into Mega Man and base expecting it to be filled with a lot of tricky, precision platforming. After all, if this game was only designed around base's more advanced platforming, as people frequently argue it is, then that's what you'd expect to see, right? When you actually go over the level design with a fine tooth comb, however, the truth is that the overwhelming majority of Mega Man and Base's stage design is remarkably standard for the Mega Man franchise platforming wise. When you compare these stage layouts to the rest of the classic series, all games that were specifically designed for just Mega Man by the way, you'll find that Mega Man and Base doesn't stray too far in terms of structure, enemy placement, combat sections, platforming set pieces, etc. Seriously, Jay and I just just aren't seeing the frustratingly difficult or terribly optimized platforming that other people are apparently seeing. To us, it plays and feels just as well as every other classic Mega Man game ever made. The spinning platforms and disappearing blocks in Tornado Man and Plug Man stages are way harder than anything in Mega Man and Base. Hell, I'd say the platforming in the original Mega Man was harder than this. Worst case scenario is Mega Man, you have to wait a little longer to get through a platforming section, or have to play some really Really easy disappearing block sections that base can often just bypass. Again, the block sections in Mega Man 1, 2, 3, and 9 are harder than any of the ones in this game. Granted, the last couple block sections in the final stage are reasonably challenging, but nothing more so than the previous games. Some of you might rightfully reply that when you knew what to do, you could easily skip these sections altogether in previous games. But what does it say about the design of those sections that you willingly chose to skip them rather than 
play the stages as they were actually designed. If anything, the fact that I never felt compelled to cheese my way through these sections tends to show an improvement in their overall design. On that note, I've heard some people criticize the removal of Mega Man's rush adapters and other platforming gadgets, but honestly, I never really missed them. For one thing, I never really felt like I needed them because again, the dirty little secret about Mega Man at base is that the platforming is actually pretty tame. For another thing, much like how Mega Man 8 made some weapons multi-purpose and have uses when platforming, Mega Man at base does the same thing with the ice wall. Not only is this effective for taking out enemies, but can act as a stepping stone not unlike the Mega Man 5 rush coil. In addition to being a moving platform to cross spikes and get into certain hidden areas. So if you find that Mega Man's single jump doesn't have quite enough reach, simply bust out the ice wall, which you'll get for beating Cold Man, who's the first boss in the weakness order, by the way. Even then, I did a challenge run where I saved Cold Man for as far into the game as possible, and there was never any moment where not having the ice wall as Mega Man made the game significantly more annoying to play. At most, it meant I couldn't reach the collectible CDs, which are optional collectibles anyway. Bottom line, Mega Man's platforming in this game is not especially challenging in my opinion, all things considered. If anything, the problem is probably the opposite. Base makes the platforming too easy, but again, that's entirely the point. The advantage to playing as base is supposed to be the ability to move through certain platforming sections a little easier. Imagine playing any of the levels from the previous Mega Man games with Base's moveset, and I think you'll agree that he'd probably break the platforming in those games just as much. My take on this whole thing is that most people choose to play as Base first because he's the new character exclusive to the game, breeze through all the platforming sections, and then play as Mega Man in a second playthrough if they bother to play as both characters at all. When they actually experience the platforming the way it would be in any other Mega Man game, they compare it to their easy time with Base and falsely conclude that Mega Man's mechanics don't match the level design. The bottom line is that there's no point in the entire game where Base's double jump or dash are required or essentially so to finish a platforming section. Everything can be finished very comfortably with Mega Man's standard jump and the harder stuff is made easier with the ice wall. And as long as we're talking about added convenience, Mega Man's slide also offers its own advantages in some situations. There are certain sections of the levels that only Mega Man can access using this ability, usually leading to helpful health pickups as well as CDs. And there are certain enemies or platforming set pieces that Mega Man can skip entirely using this ability that Base is forced to fight or jump his way through. Mega Man can also shoot through walls which Base requires an upgrade to do. This adds more replay value to these stages than you might think, and this alone warrants a second playthrough as the other character. Regarding difficulty design, Mega Man and Base is by no means an easy game, and we certainly wouldn't recommend it as a first entry in the series. That said, people severely exaggerate the difficulty in this game, and that's coming from the guy who constantly criticizes difficulty design in classic games. I don't consider myself a gaming prodigy in the slightest, and believe you me, if I thought this game was super frustrating and unfair, I'd tell you all about it. But for the most part, the SNES version of Mega Man and Base offers a perfectly fair and decent challenge that feels well balanced around both characters, though obviously in different ways. You'll have to try to finish this game, but there's very little bullshit or fake difficulty to be found. At least nothing that wouldn't also be considered such in virtually every other Mega Man game ever made. That said, we'd be remiss if we didn't discuss some of the more questionable sections of the game. Because while 90% of the level design is well done, there are those moments that can be trickier and which can cost the first time player some lines. We don't really have time to cover all of these super in depth, so we'll focus on a few of the bigger ones. One of the commonly cited instances of fake difficulty involves the first section of Tengu Man's stage. It begins with an auto-scrolling section that leads up to the first set piece. A bunch of balloons are rising up towards a set of spikes in the ceiling, so you have to walk across it to reach the platform on the other side. Stand on them too long and the balloon will pop. Jump too high and you'll die from the spikes. The section is definitely easier as base than it is with Mega Man, but even as Mega Man, clearing this set piece is pretty easy and intuitive. It only took me a couple tries to clear my first playthrough, and the game gives you an infinitely respawning extra life directly before. So worst case scenario, you die and try again without a threat of game over. The next room is a bit more questionable, however. It's a big room with a bottomless pit and multiple pathways going through that you're meant to explore for a bunch of CDs. The problem is that you don't even know what's below you, even in the Super Nintendo version, so it's possible to jump blindly forward and land in a bed of spikes or in the bottomless pit. Fortunately, if you go straight ahead, it's a straight shot to the next room, and if you're making use of the ice wall, the other paths can be relatively death-free. Certainly nothing impossible for Mega Man to clear, especially if you're making use of his weapons. One of the other stages 
that draws the most criticism is Burner Man's stage, which is commonly considered the hardest Robot Master stage in Mega Man and Base. From our experience, however, most of the stage is just a string of linear combat sections where the path to victory is pretty straightforward. The only problematic section of the stage is at the end, where these big telly enemies show up and drop napalm bombs that cover the bottom of the screen in instant kill fire. I'll be honest when I say that on my first playthrough, which was with Mega Man, I did die a few times and this is probably the most bullshit section in the main stages. Base definitely has an easier time with this since he can readily platform up the ledges and take out the cannons with his aimable buster. Still, it's not that difficult to clear as Mega Man provided you move quickly. You might have to tank some touch damage from the cannons at the beginning, which isn't good design, but the rest of the section offers ways to wait out the fire so you can take your time on the cannons. Worst case scenario, you get a game over and try again. Thankfully, Burner Man stage is also one of the shortest ones in the game. Beyond that, the rest of the level design of the Robot Master stages is entirely fair, in the SNES version at least. A lot of people complain about the possibility of knockback at the beginning of Magic Man stage, and especially this brief little section in Astro Man stage, but come on, is it really that unintuitive to wait for enemies to appear from the background and time your jumps accordingly, or to jump up to the ledges and kill the monopillons before moving forward? Base's platforming mechanics do make all these sections easier to deal with, but Mega Man can still beat all of these sections just fine with minimal frustration. There's nothing inherently wrong with a section that requires the player to be patient and pay attention. More broadly, a lot of people like to insist that the enemy placement is a big recurring problem in this game, but having poured through footage for hours in the making of this review, this problem is only really pronounced in Magic Man stage, where it's hard to see the monopellons coming in the vertical shafts. I suppose that one cannon in Mega Man's run of Burner Man and this one Sniper Joe and his run of Ground Man would count as well. For most of the game, however, I don't find that enemies are placed in areas where they surprise you from off screen or are in a position where you can't readily dispatch them. So how are the bosses in Mega Man and Base? Well, assuming you're paying attention and learning boss strategies, then it shouldn't take you more than a few lives to beat guys like Ground Man or Tango Man without their weaknesses. Whenever I think of unbeatable and poorly designed first picks, I think of Volt Catfish or Infinity Water Flea and many of the bosses in the NES games and most of the bosses in 9 and 10. Many of these guys have absolutely undodgeable attacks with zero chance of recovery. While these new Robot Masters are overall harder than the ones in 7 and 8, you only have three choices to pick at first and it's impossible to fight a couple of them without the weaknesses like we said already. The only boss that basically requires his weakness is Magic Man, who just moves far too quickly and haphazardly to be readily beatable without the Tengu Blade, but even Mega Man 7 and 8 had a boss like this. As I said towards the beginning of the review, the structure of Mega Man and base makes it so that stages like Burner Man are unreachable without having beaten stages like Cold Man, which means that if you're having trouble beating him without his weakness, that must mean you ran out of ammo because there's no way you can reach this stage without it. Again, worst case scenario, you have to play the stage again. With their weaknesses, pretty much all the bosses go down in no time. Still, they're not total pushovers like Flamestag or Split Mushroom. I mean, some of them are like Cold Man or Tengu Man, but on the whole, bosses like Pirate Man or Dynamo Man are good examples of weaknesses that make bosses easier while not completely breaking them like in Mega Man 7. You can say that Dynamo Man is annoying because of his ability to recharge his health, but the charge shot does quite a lot of damage to him and the base buster can be aimed upwards. His weakness only comes into play when he fires his electricity balls at you. The boss fights are also where most of the differences between Mega Man and base come to the forefront. While a lot of people are keen to point out base's superior platforming abilities, what they don't tend to emphasize as much is how much harder his boss battles are compared to Mega Man's. Base's rapid fire buster is only useful against normal enemies, seeing as they take continuous damage. But Robot Masters have invincibility frames, which basically means that base can do a pixel worth of damage at a time. If base is the character built for platforming, Mega Man is the one for combat, and has several clear advantages there. Sure, base's double jump makes it easier to dodge some attacks, but each of these can be comfortably dodged with a well-timed jump as Mega Man. His real advantage, however, is the charge buster, which he can permanently upgrade to increase its speed. This means that Mega Man has a much easier time taking down bosses without weaknesses, or if you run out of special weapon energy, meaning that he's a lot more freedom to play stages out of weakness order. Yes, base does get an upgrade to his buster that allows him to increase damage against bosses, but unlike Mega Man's high-speed charge, you have to equip it, meaning you can't increase base's offense and other attributes at the same time. Not to mention, the super base buster doesn't even unlock until after you've beaten six of the Robot Masters. Another thing worth mentioning is that similar to Mega Man 8, E-Tanks are gone altogether, but unlike that game, there's no rush heal or rush surprise to back you up. Honestly though, I never really
really missed E-Tanks in this game. All the bosses are perfectly well balanced around that fact, and E-Tanks certainly weren't going to make any of the sections people complain about any easier. That, and Mega Man has a couple of decent substitutes. Eddie's back from previous games and can heal Mega Man up once per stage. It's not as useful as an E-Tank or Rush heal, but it's still in the game and is reusable. Mega Man also has an automatic heal ability he can equip, which is useful for healing up before boss fights, and it even works during cutscenes, which is helpful. Base, meanwhile, has no healing items whatsoever, which isn't too bad considering the balancing of the bosses themselves, but it's still a clear disadvantage to playing as him. That's why we can't necessarily say that base is better than Mega Man, because each character has their pros and cons. One has an easier time with platforming, and another has an easier time with bosses, and most reviewers don't usually mention this. Beating each boss grants you a special weapon, and I must say, this lineup is pretty well done. Several classic games had one incredibly broken weapon, with the Metal Blades being a perfect example. I know people love it, but if the goal is to have an arsenal of situationally useful weapons, then the all-purpose Metal Blades fly in the face of that. Other Mega Man games had weapons that were either so ineffective or difficult to connect with enemies as to become worthless wastes of weapon slot, and this is something that improved with the later classic games, but with the larger charge shot and 5 and onwards, it became harder and harder to incentivize players to stray from the default weaponry and experiment with the special weapons. Mega Man in base avoids all these pitfalls and delivers with one of the most effective and situationally useful arsenal of special weapons in the entire franchise, all without removing or nerfing the default weapons like Mega Man 9 and 10 did. Pretty much all these weapons are great for combat and many have secondary applications as well. The Wave Burner, for example, is great at clearing out small enemies but can also move ball spikes underwater. I've already pointed out the multiple uses of the Ice Wall, but the list just goes on and on, like the Spread Drill being an improved Tornado Fang from Mega Man X3, the Magic Cards allowing you to pull in nearby items, or the limited use screen nuke that is the Lightning Bolt. The Remote Mine can kind of be a pain in the ass to control at times, but it's very useful for late game bosses. And on top of that, I found while experimenting with the stage order in this review that these weapons can have some very creative applications in some of the stages, which adds a lot to the overall replay value and rewards you for going out of weakness order. Some enemies, for example, can be real HP sponges, but if you go to Astral Man early, then you can bust out the copy vision and let it do all the button mashing for you. If you found yourself having a frustrating time beating some of these stages, then chances are you weren't making good enough uses of the weapons, which can make short work of trickier enemies for both Mega Man and base. They also make quick work of some of the mini bosses. Between the unique, varied, and useful assortment of weapons and the abundance of applications, Mega Man and base easily tops most classic Mega Man games, especially 1, 2, and 5 when it comes to the quality of the weapon selection. Now that said, it's time we discuss some differences between the SNES and GBA versions of this title. Being the more technically versed of the two of us, I'll be taking over the review for this section. For the most part, these two games are basically identical when it comes to gameplay, but there is one key difference that alone justifies doing a remake or rebreak episode on this matchup. Much like Sonic Genesis, Mega Man and Base on GBA suffers from screen crunch, which systematically breaks the difficulty design and makes the only official Western release of Mega Man and Base come off as more frustrating and unfair than it originally was. In case you haven't heard me say this a million times before, the GBA has a lower screen resolution than the SNES, especially vertically. At the same time, a lot of the sprite work was originally proportioned for Mega Man 8 on the PlayStation, which has an even bigger frame. That means you're playing with PlayStation-sized sprites on a tiny Game Boy Advance screen. Compare this to the Mario Advance re-releases, where the sprites were small to begin with, and the Donkey Kong Country re-releases, where the sprites were slightly shrunken for increased visibility. Even that wouldn't be so bad with an appropriately dynamic camera, but Mega Man and Base GBA simply doesn't get that right. The Mario and Donkey Kong re-releases had camera systems where your sprite was approximately two tiles above the bottom of the screen and a few tiles from the side opposite of where you were facing. This made it perfectly possible to see enemies coming ahead, and if there was ever a visibility issue, it was due to the rare enemy above or below you. For the most part, the panning of the camera system in these games was really intelligently done, and I never got the feeling that the games played significantly worse because of the smaller frame. The screen crunch in Mega Man and Base, meanwhile, exacerbates every issue from the original game and adds a whole host of new ones. Right off the bat, the camera will only sometimes pan your sprite character a couple tiles above the bottom of the frame like it ought to, which obscures the environment and makes it harder to see the ground. It's like the developers just directly centered the new GBA frame within the original one and called it a day. For the most part, the horizontal visibility in this game isn't too bad. After all, the SNES frame is only a tile wider than the GBA's on either side. Regardless, the horizontal panning during levels is non-existent. Like the classic Sonic games, except for Sonic CD, you're stuck dead set in the middle of the frame, which gives you a lot less time to react to things from any direction. Where the camera really shits the bed, however, is in the vertical visibility. Right off the bat, the GBA frame is already four tiles smaller on either side, but even that wouldn't be so bad with proper camera panning. On that front, 
front, Mega Man and base GBA is just programmed poorly. The camera doesn't like to pan vertically until you jump into the very top of or drop into the very bottom of the frame. So that means that if there's a bottomless pit or a bed of spikes above or below you, you won't be able to actually see it until it's too late. This could have easily been fixed by allowing the player to hold up or down on the D-pad to pan the camera, but for whatever reason, the developers didn't include this essential feature, nor did they revise the existing level design with a new camera in mind. I mean, sure, there were plenty of other GBA games that didn't do this, but those were also designed from the ground up with smaller sprites for a tinier screen. Now, when Jay and I defended some of the more questionably designed sections and bosses earlier, we stress again that we were defending them in the Super Famicom version only. The level design was built pretty well around the limitations of the SNES frame, but the transition to the smaller GBA frame can make these sections a lot more annoying to deal with. Take the controversial balloon section in Tengu Man stage. Earlier, we could clearly see the bed of spikes in the ceiling as well as the bottomless pit below. Now, we can barely see the spikes or the pit, making this section a lot more trial and error. This lack of camera panning also makes some of the bosses a lot harder to fight, especially when they jump upwards and out of frame. Burner Man in particular is a big pain in the ass in the GBA version, seeing as his boss arena is wider than most and that he loves to constantly jump off screen. Now, I don't want to oversell the impact of the screen crunch because I personally didn't experience too many difficulties with it in my two playthroughs as Mega Man and Base respectively. While everything I've said about the camera is true, like I said before, the horizontal visibility is passable enough, and vertical sections with lots of tricky enemies and platforming aren't especially common in this game. The new camera system is really annoying, but the game is still very much playable. Sonic Genesis is still a hell of a lot worse in this regard if you ask me. That said, I'm not really sure if I'm underselling the impact of the camera either, because I've played Mega Man and Base so many times this year that I've basically memorized it, and prior knowledge of the stage design and enemy placement goes a long way in avoiding the potential pitfalls the camera can cause. I honestly can't say for certain how much of a difference the GBA camera really makes in a first-time playthrough. No matter what, I can say that the camera design in the GBA version is technically flawed and clearly not as well optimized for the hardware as it should have been. And the worst part is the developers clearly knew better, as the camera panning during Ground Man's overhead drill attack showcases, which implies a rushed or half-assed porting job in their part. Another thing worth mentioning is Auto Shock returning from Mega Man 7 and 8. Destroyed enemies will sometimes drop bolts of varying sizes that act as currency. You can then bring those bolts to Auto Shop, which you can use to make exceedingly useful items and upgrades. Obviously, you've got your usual suspects like extra lives, spike guards, the exit chip, and the energy balancer. Additionally, you've got some items from Mega Man 8, like the high speed charge, super armor, the energy saver, and the super base buster. Some items take permanent effect, while others need to be equipped. There are a few duds, but for the most part, the items in this game are incredibly useful. Unlike Mega Man 8, there's an element of strategy that plays here thanks to the equipable parts. Do you want to increase your defense so you can take more hits, or do you want to increase your special weapon reserves? It's all up to you, and it introduces a lot of replay value. At the same time, the items don't totally break the game since they don't fully unlock until after the sixth Robot Master stage. Clearly, the developers expected players to buy these items and make the utmost use out of them. And I can't stress enough that if you're not going to use these items to beat the game, then you're deliberately handicapping yourself for no good reason. It would be like trying to beat Mega Man X without armor upgrades or heart tanks. It's possible, but unless you're looking for a challenge run of the game, it's not really recommended. Thankfully, it's not all that hard to find bolts in this game for several reasons. For one thing, the shift back to the Mega Man 7 bolt system compared to Mega Man 8 means that you're not forced to explore and backtrack through stages in order to buy upgrades, and you can buy every item in the shop in one playthrough. Second, the drop rate for bolts is reasonable, unlike Mega Man 9 and 10 where enemies only rarely drop chump change. You're almost certain to save up a respectable amount of bolts just by completing stages normally. Finally, and this is the kicker, the game gives you 800 bolts for free for clearing the eight teleporter rooms, and it's impossible to miss these pickups unless you're deliberately ignoring them. You might not be able to afford everything you want, but thankfully there's a quick and convenient farming spot in Astro Man stage where you can just save up hundreds of bolts in just a few minutes. Bottom line, this is the best shop system in any Mega Man game to date, featuring overall affordable, useful items that are strategic and helpful but don't break the game in two. If you did enjoy the collectible bolts from Mega Man 8, then never fear! Mega Man and Base has something to exercise your exploration and completionist muscles. Similar to Mega 
Mega Man 8 bolts, you'll find database CDs hidden in alternate pathways, behind special weapon destructibles, and accessible in places only reachable with certain characters and items. For example, Rush searches back for Mega Man 7, and a surprising number of CDs are buried underground. The CDs have their own save data, so you can collect them over multiple playthroughs if you want. Speaking of which, we almost forgot to mention that Mega Man in base has a full-fledged save feature with four slots, a clear improvement over all the other SNES Mega Man games. Overall, I'm pretty mixed on the CD side quest on the whole. Even as someone who likes blue coins, I've got to admit that the locations of some of these guys are not very intuitive, requiring you to go through walls or climb invisible ladders, and all the rush search ones require a second item just to find. Even then, there are a lot of these CDs that are surprisingly annoying to get, biggest reason being that Rush will stop digging if he gets hit, and for some reason the designers thought it would be a great idea to put lots of buried CDs next to constantly respawning enemies. Ultimately, it really is just a side quest and not so tied into the main gameplay that it really impacts the overall product all that strongly. The CDs themselves unlock entries in the database, and it's a pretty neat reward for finding these things. Every single Robot Master, including the Star Droids from Mega Man V on the Game Boy and the Genesis unit from Mega Man The Wily Wars, gets an entry, as well as all the main characters. They're a fun little read, at least in the SNES fan translation. The official GBA translation once again rears its ugly head here, so any incentive you might have had to find these things beyond intrinsic enjoyment is thus trampled underfoot. While the cutscene translation was serviceable enough, it's very obvious from the way these database entries were written that not enough time was put into them to make them as good as they should have been. Wait, 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 hold up. Douchey? Douchey. Douchey? How on earth does easy to fool translate to douchey? And unfortunately, this isn't the only time that the translation negatively affects the gameplay. Going back to the shop, the GBA's smaller resolution forced the developers to heavily abbreviate all the item names so that you can barely understand what they do. Also, it's surprisingly difficult to leave the shop for some reason. Otto will ask you, don't want any more items? No or yes. You have to say no to leave the shop, which which makes no sense. A properly translated game would have said something like, leave the shop, yes or no. The item descriptions themselves are okay, but compared to the fan translation, it's harder to understand what they do. In fact, the pause menu item descriptions makes two of base's buster upgrades sound like they do the same thing when they actually do very different things. Speaking of shop items, the translation also ruins the communicator, which allows you to call roll in the middle of stages for hints. While these hints are surprisingly useful in the fan translation, the official translation renders them in horrible English that fails to communicate anything substantial. Seriously, I've said this before, but this is laughably bad for 2002. What happened here? With all that said, all that leaves us to cover is the final King stages. King Fortress is pretty infamous as being one of the most frustrating castles in the entire Mega Man lineup. If you've seen my glorified X6 rant view, then you'd know I don't think anything in basically any game could get as bad as gate stages in Mega Man X6. I'd rather be playing the castles of Mega Man 8, Mega Man and Base, and Mega Man 9 in one life before I ever want to come here again. Now just because I don't think King's Fortress is as bad as Gates Laboratory and Mega Man X6 doesn't make them good levels on their own. Going outside of that and evaluating these stages on their own merits, while these aren't the best castle stages ever, I do find that for the most part they pose a fair and decent challenge. Again, for the most part. The first one is especially inoffensive, seeing it's overall pretty short and tests your platforming skills like any other castle stage would. I like how it remixes obstacles from the previous levels you've mastered already, only a bit more difficult. I don't have much to say about King Fortress 1's boss fight, except for the cheap shot at the end where you fall in the lava if you're standing on the platform when the boss dies. That was probably the worst design thing in this entire game up to this point. However, even if this was your last life, worst case scenario is you play the stage again and beat him on your next try. And since this was a good stage, I don't mind. This leads us to King Fortress 2, which is by far one of the most hated Mega Man stages of all time. A lot of people complain that the game itself doesn't refill your weapon energy in between castle stages, which became standard with X1. What these people decline to mention is that these king stages are plastered with free health and special weapon refills, as well as respawning enemies that will drop more pickups if you need them. If that's still not good enough, you're allowed to leave the castle stages to go back into the intro stage and collect and refill whatever you might need. In fact, if you're hurting for lives, you're even allowed to go back to the shop and buy more. Unlike Mega Man 9, leaving this castle to grab supplies doesn't force you to re 
play the entire castle from the beginning, so there's no negative consequences for doing this. That said, King's Stage 2 is easily the worst stage in the game. A lot of what you've heard about this stage is true, if somewhat exaggerated. The stage itself is pretty simple and will hardly get you killed. It's the bosses that make this stage so infamous. The problem with King's Stage 2 is that it feels like two complete stages crammed into one, kind of like Gate Stage 2 from X6. Because of that, you fight four separate bosses on one set of lives, which sounds terrible, but thankfully most of the bosses are really easy. First up is King Tank, which is technically a mini-boss because it doesn't have a health bar for some reason. He has multiple weak points that each generate their own attacks, but cease upon destruction. Really, the worst thing I can say about this boss is that it's kind of boring and goes on a bit too long. All its attacks are really well telegraphed, your special weapons will make quick work of his several weak points, especially if you use the energy saver item, and if you're paying attention you should beat him in a few tries at most. Hardly one of the worst Mega Man bosses ever made. I don't consider it to be a good boss from my experience. As my recent Ratchet videos have shown, a boss that drags all the while doing a lot of damage can be trying to deal with, especially since you have to prioritize which items you have equipped at once. In between bosses, there are short sections where you can kill enemies to refill your special weapons and prepare for the other bosses. There's even an infinitely respawning extra life before the second mini boss, so you can keep retrying over and over without threat of a game over. Next up, we have King Jet, which people commonly cite as single-handedly ruining the game. This is easily the worst part of the game in my personal opinion, but I can't help but feel that people exaggerate this boss's difficulty at least a little bit. You're suspended on flying platforms above a bottomless pit and have to hit the dome on the top while avoiding a powerful charging laser and fists that can destroy the platforms. As base, this boss is really easy. The remote mind conveniently latches onto him and I almost always beat him on my first try. His biggest crime then just becomes how long the fight takes and I really don't understand why this boss couldn't have had a health bar. Even as Mega Man, who gets extra platforms to jump on a compensate, I can usually beat him in one try if I pay attention, as I did my SNES run. But sometimes, like in my GBA run for this review or in the Game Mavericks run, I get stuck in a rut where the jet always seems to destroy a platform I need to jump on, causing me to fall into the bottomless pit. This seems to be the much more common experience for most people. I swear there's some element of RNG to this fist attack, where sometimes he'll never use it, and sometimes he'll use it all the damn time. Still, because of the life placed right before him, you're never gonna get a game over on this boss, which is something that a lot of reviewers neglect to mention, and I certainly never felt like I needed save states or anything. This is the worst part of the game for sure, but hardly a deal breaker in my opinion. Ah, spoiler alert! Next up is King himself. The first stage simply requires you to dodge his X attacks, which is easy with Mega Man and a bit harder with base, and after that, King's shield will be disabled and you can fight him like normal. His weakness makes pretty quick work of him as either character. We then move on to the third phase, which has a checkpoint before, where King combines the tank and the jet. This is another simple but challenging boss with telegraphed attacks and a clear weak point. Mega Man gets a platform to help him reach, but with base you have to know that dashing makes your jumps reach higher, which is kind of dickish. Either way, I think most people would recognize it as a decent boss if King Stage 2 hadn't crammed in two stages worth of content into one. Personally, between the infinitely respawning lives and ability to buy them from the shop, I don't think I've ever gotten a game over in King Stage 2. And given that three of four bosses are perfectly well designed in their own merits, I can't say this ruins what's otherwise been a pretty solid game up to this point. Which leads us to King's third stage. This is the boss rush, and I have gone on and on about how much I hate it when Mega Man games use the Mega Man 2 method for boss rushes, where you have to fight all eight of them back to back. Especially in the X game, where bosses take a million years to spawn and explode upon defeat, X1 handled the boss rush better than the other games in the series with being spread throughout the castle. Mega Man at base combines these two methods. You'll fight the bosses in one stage, however in between is a series of challenges where you can heal up and test your skills with the special weapons one last time before the curtain closes. And to that, I tip my hat to the developers. If it was my game, then there wouldn't be a boss rush at all, but if it had to be here, then this isn't a poor way to handle it if you ask me. At the end of the stage, you come across series antagonist Dr. Wily, who, as we alluded to earlier, was the secret mastermind behind King. Whether you're playing as Mega Man or base, Dr. Wily will board his latest mech and take you on personally. The first phase is very similar to Wily Machine 8, both in terms of the visual design and his gamut of attacks. Mega Man has a much easier time avoiding some of his attacks than base does, but overall, it's nothing to write home about if you're paying attention. After finishing off Wily's first phase, the usual Wily capsule appears, again reminiscent of Wily Capsule 7 and 8 in terms of attacks, but slightly different. 
What's nice about both phases of Wily in this game is that while he has weaknesses, your default weaponry is still an effective choice for both characters. Which is good since the checkpoint doesn't let you go back to recharge your weapons like all the other bosses in the stage. On top of all that, it isn't a pain in the ass to hit Wily with the magic card as opposed to the charged wild coil and the stupid fucking flame sword from the last two games. Overall, out of the three post NES classic games, this is easily the best designed Wily boss across the board, if a bit on the easy side. So this leaves us with one final thing to touch on for the video. How does Mega Man and Base fare in comparison to the other despised Mega Man games, particularly X6 and X7? If you've seen the all-inclusive Mega Man X retrospective, you would know that when I deem something to be bad design, I point it out, regardless of how I feel about the overall experience. Despite loving the original X trilogy to pieces, I still made point of criticizing X1's boss design, X2's X Hunters, and X3's backtracking and the list goes on. I don't even need to mention my X6 and X7 reviews, where I went into detail about everything those terrible games got wrong. Despite all of that, here I am reviewing Mega Man and base, and beyond a few set pieces we talked about being annoying, I honestly just didn't find many of the flaws in Mega Man and base to be as bad as people make them out to be. And what grievances I did have with the game, they only served as minor bumps in the road and otherwise fantastic experience. I found the level design, special weapons, soundtrack, and gameplay to be really well done for classic Mega Man to the point where I would easily rank this game above Mega Man's 1 through 5 or 8 or even 9 and 10. It's better than half the X games, and I'd probably go back to it before Zero's 1 and 2 as well as the ZX series easily in my top 10 Mega Man games for sure. Going back to X6 recently has reaffirmed everything that I hate about that game, and even if I don't hate X7 as much as most people, I still don't think that game has anything going for it. Even better, games like X8 still have issues with gimmicky stages and retry chips. My point in all this being that I can't comprehend what exactly it is about the Super Nintendo version of Mega Man and Base that inspires so much rage in people, since I have played Mega Man and Base a good 5 or 6 times, and I've never had this rage inducing controller throwing experience that people are always talking about. I just don't get how anyone can seriously argue that Mega Man X6 isn't as bad as people say it is, while simultaneously suggesting that Mega Man and Base is an irredeemably frustrating game with nothing going for it. But hey, I guess that's what happens when you try to review a game this complex in less than 15 minutes. With that being said, those are my thoughts on Mega Man and Base. So EXO, I'll let you give your final thoughts, as well as handing down the ROR verdict. All that leaves us with is my own thoughts on Mega Man and Base. After everything I'd heard about Mega Man and Base on the internet, I came into the SNES version this past April expecting one of the worst Mega Man games ever made. Something that would piss me off so much I'd want to break my controller in half. While I did come across a few frustrating moments, Moments, I distinctly remember getting pissed off at this disappearing block section right here. For the most part, I actually really enjoyed myself. People always extol the replayability of games like Mega Man 2 and Mega Man X1, both excellent games that I really enjoyed. But for one reason or another, with these and most of Mega Man games, I never felt any desire to experiment with boss orders or try different routes. I was always satisfied with just doing standard weakness runs whenever I did come back to them as part of a personal classic or X-Series marathon. It wasn't until I played Mega Man and Base that I was finally sold on the intricacy, open-endedness, and plasticity of the Mega Man formula. I've only owned this game for about eight months, but between my original playthroughs, the Game Mavericks run, the six runs I did for this review, and other playthroughs for shits and giggles, I've played through this game a good 15 times this year, and it simply never gets old. Mega Man and Base has fantastic level design, excellent graphics, amazing amazing music, top-notch special weapons, an inventive grid system, and overall fun but challenging boss battles. Add in two playable characters with different strengths and weaknesses, and you've got what is by far my most replayable Mega Man game ever. Are there questionably designed sections in the game? Absolutely. Did I get frustrated at points during my first playthrough? Yes. I won't deny that. It's also true that any game can seem easy when you've replayed it sufficiently. But the most frustrating Mega Man game I've ever played? Not even close. Nothing, and I mean nothing, compares to bumbling around Rainy Turtloid during the Lights Out Nightmare Effect. I'd also much rather fight King Jet than play the stupid Jetboard section from Mega Man 8's first castle stage. I even find parts of Mega Man 9 and 10 more frustrating, if I'm being honest. My first playthrough was recent enough enough that I can remember it pretty clearly, and I've honestly always found the difficulty to be pretty middling in the grand scheme of things. Not to mention that some of the things people 
complain about apply to virtually any Mega Man game, like having to replay stages upon a game over, or special weapon energy not refilling between castle stages, or bosses becoming harder when you run out of energy for their weakness. I don't see how that's some kind of big deal in this game, but not in all the others. I'm sure some people will ask why I complained about the difficulty design in this or that game, but liked Mega Man and base, and I honestly don't know what to tell you. I played this game for myself and found way more that I loved than what I hated. And I'm not about to let one terrible boss, one cheap death, and a handful of poorly placed enemies ruin the experience as a whole. This game takes a lot of risks with the classic formula and tries a lot of new things while also bringing the series back to basics in some ways. And while Mega Man and Base is far from perfect, I'd much rather play something engaging with a few flaws than something like Mega Man and 5 that's technically perfect but bland is all hell. One of my favorite games on the Super Nintendo and one of my new favorite games of all time. And that leads us into our Remake or Rebreak verdict. Remake or Rebreak. How well does Mega Man and Base on Game Boy Advance recreate and improve upon the original experience? The decision was a tougher one than you might think, but I believe I have an answer. To be fair, the game's overall design is pretty faithful to the original version, warts and all. That said, what few differences there are make the GBA re-release an overall inferior product. Reman. I define a Reman as a re-release that is below the quality of the original version, but is nevertheless competent enough to be very playable. Additionally, a Reman usually fails to address the original salient issues or add anything meaningfully new to the experience. I reserve this score for mediocre re-releases that aren't bad enough to be a re-break, but not good enough to be a remake. I've been grappling with whether to rate this game a Reman or a re-break, and ultimately, I decided that the preceding description fits Mega Man and Base GBA to a T. Right off the bat, the Capcom approved translation is just as sloppy as every other Mega Man game to come out around that time, which weakens the overall impact of the story, makes the shop harder to navigate and understand, ruins the database entries, and makes the in-game hint system nearly useless. While I don't think the GBA soundtrack is bad, the instrument choices just kind of clash, and even considering the limitations of the system, I know they could have done way better. Especially with Capcom publishing the great sounding Mega Man Zero games around the same time. The game also removes Base's dash button when it could have easily had multiple control options. On top of all of that, the GBA version fails to address any of the game's questionably designed elements and doesn't really bring anything substantially new to the table. The only real improvement I can think of is the addition of text boxes to mark checkpoints, which I did appreciate. The preceding criticisms are enough to justify a remand, in my opinion, but the GBA re-release adds a cherry on the sundae in the form of the terribly optimized camera. Even considering the resolution shift between systems, the designers simply failed to make the necessary changes that would have made the game more playable on a portable form. Form factor. At the end of the day, however, after months of grappling over the appropriate score to give this game, I just don't have it in me to rate this game a rebreak. While the GBA translation is inferior to the Aeon Genesis one, we all know that an official Super Nintendo release would have very likely had a translation that was about this bad. No! Regarding the screen crunch, while the camera is flawed in every technical sense, I found this game surprisingly playable regardless. Again, part of that is that I've played the game so many times this year to the point of memorization, but all things considered, given how bad the screen crunch is, this game plays better than it has any right to. Make no mistake, the GBA version is definitely inferior to the original and it almost crosses the rebreak threshold, but it's not quite bad enough in my opinion. Games like Sonic Genesis and Pac-Man World GBA are insufferable to play, and while a rebreak doesn't necessarily have to be that bad, I find that Mega Man and Base GBA is just competent enough to avoid the mark of shame. Even if Mega Man and Base GBA isn't one of the worst re-releases I've reviewed on this segment, it still deserves a prominent spot in this marathon for just how much it affected this game's reputation. I can't say for sure that people would view this game all that more favorably if the Super Nintendo version version had gotten an international release in 1998, but I think it's fair to say that the GBA version did absolutely nothing to help the matter, especially when it was chosen over the original version to be re-released on Virtual Console. Capcom could have given the game a second chance by including the SNES version on the second Legacy Collection, but despite the game being canon to the numbered series, they decided to leave it out. And that's a shame, because I would recommend
recommend Mega Man and Base to fans of the classic Mega Man franchise. If you haven't already played Mega Man and Base and have steered clear of it on the internet's recommendation, then I'd compel you to give the SNES version an honest shot and form your own opinions. If you have played this game for yourself and didn't care for it, then I'd compel you to give this game a second chance on SNES, especially if you've only ever played it on the GBA or Wii U. I can't promise you'll like it as much as I do, but I think you'll find it isn't quite as frustrating as you remember it. Even if you don't own an SNES, the original never got a North American release anyway, so that's completely irrelevant. If you've played the game multiple times and know for a fact that you hate it, then I'll respect that even if I don't agree with it. I just want to emphasize that just because one reviewer said the game sucked and is irredeemably frustrating doesn't make it a proven fact now and for all of time. A reviewer's opinion is just that an opinion, and they're most certainly welcome to it because this game isn't for everyone. But you should never let any one person decide your opinions for you, whether it's me, Jay, or anybody else. As long as you can give this game an honest, fair shot and can argue your case, then I'll respect whatever verdict you come to. Now that this review has come to a close, I figured I'd say more about me in case you're unaware. Over at my channel, you'll find a wide assortment of game reviews, not unlike that of EXO himself. As established earlier, I'm most well known for my all-inclusive of Mega Man X Retrospective, where I reviewed all 11 Mega Man X games and evaluated where the series went wrong and how. The earlier videos in the retrospective have already begun to show their age, so I would recommend starting off with some of the later ones if you're a Mega Man fan. Other than that, I've done analytical videos for some of my favorite franchises such as Sly Cooper, Metal Gear, and Ratchet and Clank, so I hope to see you soon. With that said, I'll hand the mic back to you, XO, to close the video off. Well. That ended up being one of the hardest videos I've ever worked on, but once again, I have no regrets. Mega Man and Base is a game that's very difficult to do justice in a shorter review because there's just so much to talk about. Anyways, did you guys know it's almost the four year anniversary of Remake or Rebreak? Time sure does fly, doesn't it? Well, I was originally going to save this episode for later in the Mediocre Marathon, but seeing as our Tetracentennial is almost upon us, I think it's time to revisit an old matchup. Ladies and gentlemen, join me next time for a second look at Super Mario Bros. on the NES and Super Mario Bros. Deluxe for the Game Boy Color. We'll be looking at the All-Stars version for the Super Nintendo as well. Until then, I'm Exaparadigm Gamer, and I hope you all enjoyed the review. Alright, I'm never doing an hour-long review for anything ever again, unless if it's for like one of my favorite games or something, which this game winded up being, go figure. As always, before the curtain closed, I wanted to direct you towards some other places you could check me out at. My second channel is EPG Plays, where I publish Let's Play series and offer more analytical commentary. So far, I've covered the three Donkey Kong Country games, and I'm about halfway through a playthrough of Spire the Dragon, which will resume after I publish this review. I've also got my podcast channel on Versecast, where myself, Hadox, Ryrule, and King K talk about games and read bad fanfiction. We're preparing for an end of the year podcast right now, so keep your eyes out. Go check those out and enjoy your bad selves. I'll see you guys for the next review. Bye!